10 brutal murder cases in Nigeria that has remained unsolved. Up till this day, these victims have not gotten their justice. At number 10, Prince Imabuchi, Delta State. On the 11th of July 2022, the decomposing body of a Nigerian actor, Prince Imabuchi, was discovered in his apartment in Asaba, Delta State. He had been brutally murdered with an axe and his body was found wrapped in a mattress that was left in his living room. Prior to his body being discovered, Prince Imabuchi was last seen around the 5th of that month. But on the 6th, his personal assistant by the name of Sonny Sunday Ikema Kolam, who also lived with the actor, was seen by a neighbor moving properties belonging to the actor from the apartment into a van. When confronted by this neighbor, Sonny claimed that he was ordered by the actor to move these properties to a location for a movie set production. And that was a lie that seemed fitting, that somehow got Sonny off the hook, because that would have been the moment Sonny would have been caught and arrested. Although the neighbor said she tried to reach Imabuchi to confirm if indeed he had sent his PA to move his properties out of his house, but the call was to no avail. And the only reason she couldn't reach the actor was because dead people don't take calls. It was most absolutely possible that Imabuchi had already been killed and was already stuffed in his mattress when his properties were being moved out of his apartment on the 6th of July 2022. However, it would take another week for the neighbors to realize that Prince Imabuchi was still home and was never at a movie set. The smell of his decomposing body was what informed his neighbors, family and friends that he was dead. And it did not take long to assume the prime suspect, his assistant, Sonny. However, as at the time of making this video, it has been near over a year and nothing had been said about the killer or killers of the actor. Sonny the assistant has not been caught and arrested and no one seemed to know who Sonny was or where Imabuchi had picked him up from. Although sources claimed Sonny was a former butcher at a market in Abia State, whom the actor decided to take under his wings to help to give him and his family a better life. But that's as far as what's being said. For now, the case of Prince Imabuchi remains unsolved and with each passing year, it gets colder. The sad part about Prince Imabuchi's murder case is the fact that it should be something that could have been easily solved. The fact that we know the name of the suspect, the Sunday guy, the fact that we know his full name and we have a picture and yet he has not been declared wanted is still something that baffles me with how the police handle certain kind of murder cases. This is one case that I think if this was the United States or if it was in an advanced country, it could have been easily solved. Number 9. Emeka Vincent Abuja On the 1st of August 2021, a 37-year-old popular Nigerian chef by the name of Emeka Elugo was found dead in his house in Kantampe Extension, Abuja, by his newly wedded wife, Chidima, who had just returned from church. He was said to have been stripped naked, tied, beaten, and strangled to death. Descriptively, this light-skinned man had already turned green by the time he was discovered. Chef Emeka had recently celebrated his birthday and had just returned from Dubai a few weeks before this gruesome incident. Some of his friends and family believed he was killed by people he knew because it was said on that Sunday evening, after his wife and mother-in-law had left for church, he was visited by two men who must have passed through the tight security of the compound and only him could have permitted the security man to let them in. According to what was said at the time, Emeka was supposed to be at church with his wife, but chose to stay back because he was expecting two guests for a business meeting purpose. However, it seemed the business meeting did not go as planned, as these two male guests had other things in mind, which included stripping, tying, beating, and strangling of the victim. The weirdest part of this home invasion was that the two guests did not steal anything, which made it clear that they had only just come to kill. After a few months, it seemed the police had a breakthrough on the case when they arrested three men in connection to the murder. One Mr. Kingsley Obina, Mr. Musa Tanimu, and a man named Mohammed Shahaba. These three men were named to be the people who conspired to kill Chef Emeka. However, that is all that would be said by the police about them. It's been well over two years and we still don't know why or if at all they were the one who did it. We don't know the evidence that ties them to Chef Emeka and worst of all, like the police had promised that they will be charged to court, up to now, 
nothing had been said if they were eventually taken to court. It's been well over two years. Although people had claimed that they were just scapegoats used as a front to make it seem as though the police had done their job. But up to now, how these three men were connected to the death of Chefi Mika is still unknown. And neither have they been charged to court like the police assured us two years ago. And that is why the case of Chefi Mika remains unsolved and cold. Chefi Mika's case is still one that I still don't get. Yes, the police told us they arrested these three guys. And up till now, we still don't know what happened to these three guys. We don't know if they are still in prison. We don't know their case. We've not heard their own side of the story. How are these three men connected to Chefi Mika? How did they kill him? And why did they kill him? I feel for Chefi Mika, the family are keeping a lot of things private. Maybe trying to protect his image. And in the process of doing it, they are either not letting the police publicize the case or like I've seen in most situations, they are rather not move forward with the case because they know the case would open a can of worms or secrets that may implicate the deceased and may maybe affect his image. Justice does have a price, it does. And I can understand why for Chefe Mega, the family may not want to publicize it if they are chasing it at all. Number 8. Ugochi Unwori, a Boeing State. Ugochi Unwori was a 26-year-old young TikToker who was found dead in a hotel room in a Boeing State on Monday, 2nd May 2022. After it was said she was approached by two men at a bar who solicited sex for money. According to Ugochi's friend, the men had approached other girls in the bar for a similar offer but they were all turned down by everyone else even by Ugochi's friend. However, when these two strange men presented the same offer that everyone else had rejected to Ugochi, she took it and then she left with the two men to a nearby hotel. This would be the last time Ugochi Unwori would be seen alive. I'm from Nigeria. I'm from the next day, during a routine check, in the hotel, Ugochi would be found dead in one of the hotel rooms, naked with her hands, legs, and mouth tied. And when the police were involved, they discovered a total of 12 condoms in that same room, having them to believe Ugochi had been gang raped by presumably more than just two men. Although the case seemed promising at the time, given the amount of details and the account of a friend, I mean, if the friend had seen the two men, and if more people had also seen these two men, how hard would it have been to identify them? Unfortunately, it turned out to be harder than it seemed. Another factor was that the 12 pieces of used condom found in the hotel room might contain DNA samples that could easily be used to identify the perpetrators. But due to technological setback, the police may not be able to go through that route. The only thing left for them to do was for the witness to describe the two men. And hopefully, with the description given, the police would be able to trace their suspects. However, one extra detail of the vehicles these men came with was what might have played a role in the overall coldness of this case. Gochi's friend's description of the vehicle or plate number believed to have been used or driven by this man suggested that they were most likely foreigners or even more so, they were in transit, which meant that they were not from the states nor were they from the country. They were travelers who, as at the time of the whole chaos, were most likely on their way out of the country. This possibility may have played a big role in why this case remains unsolved and may go unsolved for a very long time. I don't even know what to say when it comes to Ugochi and Warriors case. I really don't. It's almost like it's one of those things that if these men were indeed foreigners, then they are gone. <laughs> it's sad. Some of these cases on this list, I see them being solved later on if the police decide to take it up for real. But when it comes to Ugochi Warriors case, I don't see it being solved. When the story was first published on our channel, some people in the comment section suggested that the DNA test from the condoms be used to find the people. Maybe they will try everyone in the hotel and see if the DNA test in any of these condoms match anybody who works at the hotel. You know, if she went in with two men, how come there were 12 condoms? In my opinion, at the time, I thought maybe the people who did it just set up 12 condoms to set the scene, to create a division, to, you know, distract the police or make it more difficult for them. I don't know if you get, that was what I thought. 
but if the chance or the possibility that these people the, the two so-called men were foreigners then that is all there is this is one case that probably may never be solved number seven Chop Boy, Gwezi, B. Rollins, and Blessing, Abuja. Chop Boy was an upcoming Nigerian singer who was found brutally murdered, along with three of his friends, at a house in 62nd Crescent, Guarimpa, Abuja. It was said that Chop Boy had gone to a studio located in the home of one of the victims, known as Gwezi. Chop Boy had gone with his friend and producer, B. Rollins, and B. Rollins' girlfriend, Blessing. They had all gone there to work on a song. Little did they know that something was about to go wrong. The killers, believed to be a group of young boys, were reported to have been allowed into the house by the security because it was a normal thing for young men to come and go into the studio in the house. It was typical and nothing strange. However, unlike other young men in the past who had come into Gwezi's house to record a song, this group of young men on this day had come with a different motive. According to reports, the killers were allegedly after B. Rollins, as it was said that B. Rollins had been threatened multiple times in the past by an unknown group of people, who most likely might be known to him, and maybe just him. When the killers stormed the house, it is believed a confrontation ensued. However, Chuck Boy, Gwezi, B. Rollins and his girlfriend Blessing were not exactly prepared for that kind of fight because the men who had just come in were equipped with weapons, machetes, axes and most possibly knives. It's like bringing a gun to a rap battle. Chop Boy and his friends were butchered to death. With the loud music playing in the background, neighbors say they heard screams but just when they could place the tone, the screams were followed by a happy birthday chant and a loud music making it out to be a birthday party. The investigation done by the police revealed that B. Rollins was the main target and that Gwezi, Shop Boy, and maybe Blessing were all collateral damages. A writing that was left on the wall with the blood of the victims read, it told him not to play with her. This writing will make it out to be some kind of fight over a girl believing to be B. Rollins' girlfriend, Blessing, who unfortunately was also a victim. Up to this day, this case remains unsolved as no one has been named or arrested in connection to the Guarimpa 4 murder case. The Guarimpa 4 murder case is just confusing to me. I can understand that maybe the group of people who came to attack these young men were probably cultists, but how hard could it be to find someone, at least a suspect, but my fear is I don't think the police are trying. I don't think they are actually trying to solve it. That is the thing with a lot of these cases. It's one thing for it to be there. It's another thing for it to be in the process of being solved. But I do see this case getting solved one day. There's a lot of people involved for someone not to know something at least. The only problem is if it can be solved anytime, it should have been solved at the time it happened. So for the fact that it wasn't quickly solved at the time it happened, I think the chances of it getting solved eventually is pretty tight. Number 6. Esther Isaac Asuko, Abuja On the 25th of February 2022, Esther Isaac, a 22-year-old young lady, lodged in a room in Agete Hotel in Guarimpa, Abuja. It was believed Esther had only just traveled from her hometown in Akwaibon to Abuja where she met up with an unidentified man of whom it was said she lodged in the hotel with. Mysteriously, the man did not stay long at the hotel. Barely an hour after he and Esther made for their room, it was said he left, presumably leaving Esther alone in the hotel room they had just lodged in. Assuming he was going to come back to the hotel, the workers did not think too much of it. Until the next morning, during a routine check, when Esther was found dead in the room. The police were said to have been immediately called and Esther's body was immediately evacuated for autopsy. Her brother Emmanuel was also contacted and the case file for her mother was opened, except it wouldn't take long before it would go cold. The case was stalled by the inability to identify the man Esther had lodged with, as the security camera from the hotel did not work that day. Autopsy revealed Esther was strangled and beaten to death, and unlike similar cases like this, it appeared Esther did not have any sexual activity with the said man as she was fully clothed when she was found dead which might have explained why the man left almost immediately after arriving as though he had only lodged with Esther 
for the purpose of just killing her. Esther's case was one that could have been easily solved by men looking into her phone records, but the case stalled. And despite Emmanuel, Esther's brother, advocating for his sister's case to be prioritized, it was still left in the cold, making it one of Nigeria's unsolved murder cases in recent times. Esther Isaac's case is really sad because I know how well Emmanuel, her brother, has pushed for justice to be served for this girl. Because I remember the story at the time when the story first came out, it was said that the police did not care for the story because they assumed she was a sex worker. You know, they called her the, the prostitute ward. So when Emmanuel went to meet the police and, you know, to seek justice for his sister, they were like, collect the money the hotel wants to pay you. Your sister was a little girl. So they just pretty much dismissed it, almost as though just because she was perceived to be a sex worker, her life did not matter as much, that the case does not matter to them as it should have been. So I, I remember that period of time, and I also remember that the brother kept pushing. I think he texted me to that period of time. We chatted. He was trying to give me updates on the case. The last I remember conversing with him was that the police have refused to give him the phone. They refused to open her mobile phone to check the call log, which in my mind, I was like, is it such a difficult thing for the police to unlock someone's phone and check? I feel like our security agencies should be strong enough to do such a thing. They should have hackers or people who can go through someone's mobile phone or at least call the network provider to check who she spoke with last and find the suspects from there. It's as easy as that. But, you know, that wasn't done in this case. Number five, Toritsejo Emmanuel Jackson, Abuja. Emmanuel Jackson was a 23-year-old law graduate who was stabbed several times to death in front of the top rank hotel in Wuse Zone 4 by some unidentified men in the early hours of Sunday, September 12, 2021. He was said to have returned to Nigeria from the UK in January 2021 to attend law school and complete his NYSC before possibly returning back to the UK. However, that part of the plan would not come to pass as his life was gruesomely cut short in an unexplained circumstance that remains mysterious till this very day. According to what we know, somewhere in the midnight of September 11, 2021, it was said one of Torit Sergio's friends had invited him out, and it was believed that they had gone to a few different places before arriving at Top Rank Hotel, where they had come to see few friends who had invited them. Few moments after seeing their friends at the hotel, they left the hotel and made for the parking lot outside the hotel, where it was said an unknown number of men out of the darkness, pounced heavily on Emmanuel through its edge, stabbing him multiple times as he most likely screamed and ran for his life. After the men were done stabbing him, Emmanuel Jackson ran back into the hotel building where he bled to death. It was by dawn that his body was eventually evacuated by the police. Through its edge's case was stalled till it went cold. Despite the fact that there was a CCTV footage that showed what happened that night, nothing was done because it was next to impossible to see the faces of the killers in the video as most of it were pitch dark about seven people that were around the hotel were arrested for questioning but they were released multiple times with no progress to the case up until now nothing has been said or done about the brutal murder of torrid sergio emmanuel jackson Though Toja's life was aborted, his loved ones say his memory will live in their heart forever. Torsetri Emmanuel's story is one that I think will scar me for life. It's one of the... I remember the story when I... That was when we first started. And I also remember seeing the CCTV footage. It's unfortunate that the CCTV footage did not go viral. It was not publicized. When it first happened, we had just started our channel. And I remember someone sending me the video on Instagram, a very unknown account. The person sent me the CCTV footage and I saw it. And I could not share it then. If I was like a gist blogger kind of thing, I would have probably put it out there so that people would have seen. But I also remember chatting with the brothers and they specifically told me that they don't want it out there. They don't, it's not something that they want to put out. And the police also made it clear that the CCTV footage should not be put out. And so I wasn't sure, I don't think I would, even if it happens now, I wouldn't have put it out there. Sometimes you just have to show respect to the family of these victims because I'm sure they too wanted justice for their loved one more than I did. But it was a very painful CCTV footage to watch. It's something that still haunts me till now. I remember seeing the CCTV footage very clearly 
after it said you and his friend went to the hotel reception i remember seeing the friend behind him because it was Tori Sergio that was doing the talking for a friend that invited him out it seems like Tori Sergio was the one leading the friend was just holding a bag then they went to see whoever they went to see at the hotel which I was hearing is a group of females I heard it's a group of females later on and it's not clear what they went there to do there were rumors that it had something to do with drugs although the family has denied the boy had anything to do with drugs Two of them did not stay long at the hotel. So it wasn't like they went to see friends that they would want to hang out with. They just went there and as soon as they were done, they left. And when they left, I remember seeing the CCTV footage of them going out in the parking lot where it's somehow pitch dark, but you could see through it, Sergio and his friend walking in the parking lot. Now that parking lot is also outside of the hotel, in the streets, I believe. The parking lot is outside of the hotel in the streets. And I remember, if I remember correctly, because I can't find the footage anymore, it's no longer in my possession. I remember vividly seeing Torit Sergio and his friend walking and they were laughing and Torit Sergio kept on walking. But this friend somehow suddenly stopped walking alongside Torit Sergio, which to me made it seem as though that friend knew what was about to happen. Because all of a sudden the friend drifted and went to the corners towards the hotel wall. The moment the friend drifted away from Torit Sergio, it was so dark, but I could count about two, three men out of nowhere holding their hostages. They took a moment. It's almost as if they knew it was Torit Sergio they were coming for because there was a point they held the friend. In the CCTV footage, it was a point they held the friend, but the person who held the friend left the friend and joined the other two to accost um, Torit Sergio. So even if Torit Sergio was with three other people, it seemed like it was Torit Sergio they really came for, not the friend. And they went straight for, to Torit Sergio, despite him being with his friend, and despite them also having a moment to hold the friend. It was a split moment as to them checking the friend's face to see if he was the one that they needed. But realizing he was not the one, they continued pouncing on Torit Sergio. Could it be a drug deal gone wrong? It's hard to tell. It's honestly hard to tell. But the killers, I don't know. I don't see them being caught. It's unfortunate. Unless the friend is going to say something that he knows, even though he might be implicated. It's hard to tell. It's really hard. It looks like a case that should have been easily solved. But the CCTV footage was very dark and you could barely see anything. You could only see shadows. Number four, Temple George by Elsa. George was a 30-year-old baker who lived alone in Yenegoa by Elsa State until he was killed on Friday, 16th April 2021, and locked in his apartment. His body was found in his bathroom by his neighbors and the landlord around 4 p.m. the next day after a client who had paid him to bake a cake could not reach him because he didn't show up. The discovery of Temple George's body in his apartment was a shocking discovery. And during investigation, a neighbor said he had seen him talking with two people the night before and had later heard someone scream at night. But when she tried to verify the noise, she claimed she did not see anything. A family member of Temple George claimed that it was the third time someone had tried to kill him. Except this time around, they succeeded. It was said the police had begun investigation. But apparently, since no one could identify the two men Temple George was seen speaking with the day before he was killed, no progress has been made to the case, making it one of Nigeria's unsolved murder mysteries and a case that has soon gone cold. I remember Temple George's story. I remember when it happened. I remember, I think I was still in Port Harcourt at the time. And from what I hear, I'm not very sure, but I remember that it was said that a day before he died, he was seen with two guests. He was seen with two people. Neighbors say they saw him with two people. Some people say they saw him with two people at a restaurant. And he was talking with them and he looked nervous. And then it's as if the two people followed him to his house. And it was later on in the house that, you know, he was most likely robbed and killed. And I will say this off the record. Even back then when the story was happening, usually at the time, people used to chat up. Even till now, when we do a story, people will message you and tell you what they know regarding the story. And I remember someone telling me back then that there were people who knew the two guys, but they were scared to speak up because they were afraid the police would arrest them. And they also said that the sister of Temple George, instead of meeting the friends of Temple George to cooperate, 
and give them information, it was said that the sister was so angry that she just ordered or told the police to arrest all ten to just friends, which kind of made a lot of them run away, which made a lot of them scared to speak up. So it's almost as if she scared away the people that might know something regarding the death of the boy. The supposed people who know something felt that there was no need to speak because the person that they are going to speak against may come for them and the person that they are going to speak to wants them arrested. How do you get justice for your brother now when you really want the police to arrest all his friends? It's sad. It's painful because these are people that could have easily helped the police or giving you one or two things that they know or giving you one or two names but rather you were so angry that you started coming for them to get arrested but it's unfortunate he i wished the people who knew something had said something regardless number three godwin ayogu ghana godwin ayogu was a 19 year old nigerian student studying in ghana he was found murdered on Wednesday, February 19, 2014. He was a 300 level student of social sciences at the University of Cape Coast in Ghana. It was believed that he was killed by unknown persons and his body was dumped by the roadside. Godwin was said to have been last seen alive on Tuesday, February the 18th at the university campus. According to investigations, it was claimed that he had borrowed part of his school fees, $5,000 to his roommate, Ogun Sayo Abayomi who refused to pay back when Godwin needed the money. It was also alleged that he had reported to other Nigerian students in the university to help him confront Ogu Sanyo to pay back the money so he would pay his school fees. However, a day after confronting Ogu Sanyo, Godwin was later found dead with several stab wounds on his body, with his legs and hands tied. It was believed he was killed in the process of trying to get his money. Five students, who were all Nigerians, were arrested but they were later released after several months in police custody and after being taken to court. In fact, it was the court who asked they be released due to insufficient evidence that these five boys killed Godwin Ayogu. Despite efforts by the Lagos state government and the Nigerian embassy in Ghana, no further progress had been made regarding the killers of Godwin Ayogu. Yogu's story literally is one of the first story I ever did way before I called myself True Crime Daniel. I did a small playful documentary regarding it. It was one of the first stories I had heard of. In fact, it is the first story I, I did as True Crime Daniel. It was the very first story. If anything, Godwin Ayogu is the story that started off the channel that we know now as True Crime Daniel. But this is what I would say with Godwin Ayogu's story. Because I remember when I did the first research, I spoke to some of these, the suspects, some of the boys who were arrested. I did reach chat them up on Instagram and Facebook and, and I chatted with about two, three of them and they were already grown at the time. So they were, one was already working, they were no longer students, one was already abroad. So they were grown at the time. The ones who were able to speak to me regarding the case were able to, one of them said he would not. And there was something about the case that baffled me when I was researching about it. There was actually two sides of the story, or there's a flip side of the story. Whereas Godwin Ayogu borrowed Abayomi money, the money from what I got that Godwin gave to Abayomi was another money in total, was another money that was not in the school fees. However, Godwin also had an issue with his current roommate at the time. Abayomi was his former roommate. At the time Godwin was killed in his 2-300 level, Abayomi was a roommate from the 100 or 200 level. Abayomi was no longer roommates with um, Godwin. So he was now living off campus or he was living on his own per se. Now, there was another person, another roommate that Godwin had that was Ghanaian. I can't remember his name. That was keeping Godwin's money for him. So that $5,000, Godwin had given it to his roommate who was Ghanaian. I can't remember his name. And it was that roommate that kept the money for Godwin. The only problem is, whereas Godwin was looking for money to pay his school fees fast as he could, the money he was keeping with his Ghanaian roommates suddenly also vanished. That money was not seen. That money, the Ghanaian roommate could not provide it. Even though Godwin had taken money. In fact, the reason why Godwin gave the Ghanaian roommates the money was because he saw himself eating from it. 
So he did not want to keep eating from it. He did not want to keep spending from it. So he gave it to his Ghanaian roommate. It was when he wanted to pay his school fees and he wanted to complete the money with the money Abayomi was owing him. That was when all this chaos came up. So yes, Abayomi was owing him money. And yes, the money he kept with his current roommate at the time was still there, but missing. So both Abayomi and the Ghanaian roommates could not provide Godwin's money from what I remember, from what I researched from. From the research I got, the Ghanaian roommate also could not provide the money Godwin had given to him to keep, which kept Godwin at a tight hand. $5,000 gone. The friend, the money Abayomi was owing him, he could not get it too. So Godwin was literally scouting and trying to get money. He was trying so hard to find money to fix his school fees. That was why he kept going to Abayomi and privately in his own room, he was also confronting his Ghanaian roommate about his money. It's almost as if the two roommates, the ex-roommate Abayomi and the Ghanaian roommates, ripped Godwin off his money. But now this is where the problem comes in. Whereas Abayomi and all the other Nigerian friends were arrested, or were taken into custody by the police and investigated, the Ghanaian roommate was never. I know a lot of Ghanaians were upset when I first did the video. They were like, oh, you're pinning it on a Ghanaian boy, but this is not about Ghanaian or Nigeria. The Ghanaian roommate was never among the group of boys taken. He should have been among, because these Nigerian boys were taken to the courts, and the courts listened to the case and found out that there was no sufficient evidence to claim that these boys did this thing. The case did not make it to trial. So in the hearing of the court case between um, the four Nigerian um, boys, there will be five Nigerian boys, and between the four Nigerian boys and Godin Ayogu's death, the Ghanaian court did not see enough evidence to say that these boys did it. And the case was thrown out of court. However, it still baffled me why the police, the Accra police per se, did not take the Ghanaian roommates who also could not account for Godwin's $5,000 that he was holding for Godwin. Why wasn't that particular boy, why wasn't he taken along with the Nigerians? Why was he left uninvestigated? The Ghanaian boy was not investigated. Yes, maybe the Nigerian boys might have done it, but they were investigated. They were taken to court, and the court said that they did not have enough or sufficient evidence to hold them. So that was done for them. So why didn't that Ghanaian roommate go through that same thing to at least get out of it? Even if he's taken to court and the court say no sufficient evidence, that would be good. But the fact that there is still one stone left to be turned in the case of Godwin Ayogu is why I feel like this case can still be reopened and this case can still be looked into because that is the truth. Another thing again about the case that was tricky or interesting is that Godwin's mother claimed she got a phone call from the Ghanaian roommate telling her that he knows something about the case but he's afraid for his life to say something. And even with that detail, the Accra police, the Ghanaian police, still did not look into that Ghanaian roommate. They just, it made it seem like they just wanted to make it a Nigerian on, on Nigerian crime thing. And so they did not want to just go through that route. So the, the Ghanaian roommate was not questioned. He was not interviewed. He was not taken to anywhere. And he's the one that was giving the $5,000 and he could not provide it to Godwin, which in my opinion is suspicious, which in my opinion is a motive. But it was never looked into. Not to the best of my knowledge, it was never looked into. If justice really wants to be served for Godwin Ayogu, I feel like wherever the Ghanaian roommate is, he should finally come out and speak as to what he remembers from that day. And he should also come out and give account of what happened to the rest of the money that Godwin gave to him to keep. Because he never gave Godwin back that money. Number two, Cedric Foko Ludovic. Anambra State. Cedric Foko was found dead in his apartment in Onicha, Anambra State, sometime towards the end of 2021. His body was found stabbed, beaten, and also strangled, with his properties stolen and his apartment ransacked. At the time he was found, it was already at a serious stage of decomposition, which made it unlikely to know the exact day he was killed. And it was clear that his killer or killers were the ones who may have ransacked his apartment. Cedric was a Cameroonian but had come to Anambra State to live with his in-laws. He had started a barbing saloon and also began installing POP in people's houses and making skit videos. He was pretty much 
doing well for himself. Although the prime suspect in his mother case was very visible and very clear and was named to be one Ezekiel Nweke, who was said to have also gone missing around the time Cedric was found dead. Ezekiel was Cedric's employee and roommate. Although they shared the apartment with two other people, Ezekiel and Cedric shared a room. Ezekiel was said to have been hired by Cedric to work in his barbing saloon in which he would be remitting 6,000 naira weekly to Cedric and keeping the rest to himself. But weeks before Cedric was found dead, Ezekiel and Cedric had a disagreement and according to neighbors, Cedric had complained to them about Ezekiel and this would be revealed after Cedric's body had been found. It was also said a neighbor had seen Ezekiel moving some properties weeks before Cedric's body was found, including a television set, as well as other barbing equipment from Cedric's saloon. And this made it very clear that Ezekiel Nweke was the number one prime suspect behind the death of Cedric Foko. Sources revealed that Ezekiel moved to Port Harcourt. However, up to now, Ezekiel still walks free as he has not been caught and arrested. Although this case seemed to have the possibility of being solved, for now, it remains unsolved and appears to be running cold. Cedric's case is heartbreaking for one because I remember chatting with the in-law then. We still talk and the last we spoke, they're still trying to find this boy. For what is worth, they know where he is. They know his exact location in Port Harcourt. But yet, I don't know why. It's almost as if the police in each state are not cooperating enough. See, ever since I started doing this channel, I've been noticing some things with Nigerian police. Sometimes it's almost like if the case does not have enough clout, they won't chase it. Because I remember this very well and the boy Ezekiel pretty much moved to Port Harcourt. And they were able to bait him into giving out his location and they were able to find his location. But up until now, he's still not arrested. It's one thing that if he ran away, if he ran out of the country. But this boy killed somebody, allegedly, took the person's properties, went to Port Harcourt, opened his own barbing saloon. The police know where he is, but they keep demanding money from this Cedric's family. Every time they are demanding money. Do you really need money from the family? Shouldn't it be your job to just get there, arrest the boy and take this to court? I don't know why this case is stolen. They know who he is. They know where he is. They know where to find him. All that is left is to go and find him. Or at least make him a wanted person. Why can't they just... When it was Mobad's case, it was quick for them to put out someone's picture as wanted. But when it comes to this serious case where we know the murderers, why is it difficult for them to just say, okay, this guy is wanted. Declare him wanted. Put his picture out there and let everybody know that he's a suspect. It's almost like if there's not enough clout, some cases may never get solved. Number one, Eunice Olawale Abuja. Eunice Olawale was a mother of seven and a deaconess in a popular Pentecostal church parish in Kubwa, Abuja. She was killed in the morning 9th of July 2016 when she went out to preach the gospel around 5 a.m. Some weeks before the incident, she overheard a conversation about some Muslims in the area not being happy with what she was doing. She stopped her preaching for a while before she continued. According to reports, Eunice was stabbed several times and left to bleed to death on the street with her megaphone and Bible by her hands. By dawn, she was taken to the police station where her family later came to identify her. As at the time, six suspects were arrested, but in the end, nothing was done because of lack of evidence. The brutal murder of Eunice Olawale remains one of Nigerian unsolved and cold cases with no chance or hope of her getting the justice she deserves. At the burial site, prayers are offered and the casket is lowered. Come and lower the casket. Born on the 23rd of July 1974 and buried on her birthday 42 years later, many people see Deaconess Olawale as a hero, a Christian who died at her post. Now, Eunice Olawale's story is one we've talked about many times. This should be our third, if not fourth time, talking about it. It's unfortunate. That case is one of those ones where, in my opinion, I know will or may never be solved because it is political as it can be. It wasn't personal. Some people did not like her preaching, and so they sent some people after her, and she got killed. And that's pretty much what it is. I, uh, it's sad. It's an unfortunate one. I do hope it's a story that we will continue to remember it will make up our history, but it's good that she's not forgotten. But it's bad that Akilas may never be found. It's very sad. It's very unfortunate. 